and welcome back to the the channel. Um, we're back with some more GAA action. Um, we're going to start um, this episode's going to be on the hurling championship, and once again, I'm joined by Connor McKenna, who um, has informed me he's a, he's seen a, a lot of the action, and I'm sure he'll have plenty to say on what's happened over the weekend. So, how's things, Connor? Good day, uh, Jerry, and yourself? Yeah, all good, all good. So. Um, to start off then anyway, um, obviously we had some uh, some of the All-Ireland sort of series started off with, with quarterfinals in the Leinster and Munster Hurling Championships. So we'll start off then anyway, on Saturday evening we had Dublin and Leash, a repeat of um, one of the, I believe it was one of the qualifying rounds possibly last year where, where Leash got the surprise, but there was no um, there was no surprise this year. What did you, what did you make of the game? Yeah, it was a very, very good game. I heard, and I think that Dublin last year, I wouldn't say it's at least for granted, but they mightn't have expected the intensity that Leaf brought and the quality Leaf brought on the day. But this year, they did expect it, and Dublin, they kind of they made no mistake. They were very, very strong. It was 231 to 23 points. They were done by 14 points. Then Matty Kenny would be very, very happy. But, um, but, but no, Dublin were, were very, very impressive. The, Donald Burke was excellent for Dublin. I think he scored 116 on the day, and that's a new find. I don't think he played last year. So there's definitely talent within the Dublin ranks. And look, it'll be interesting to think Kenny in the week that will have to be a big step up. But no, Dublin can can take a lot. But but Leash, um, Leash should be slightly disappointed. They were kind of in the game. They kept in the game for large periods. 14 points might have been slightly harsh on them, but they're probably just slightly out of their depth there in the Liam McCarthy. Now, that's probably a bit unfair to say because they did win the Joe McDonough last year. And then they got to the All Ireland quarter final after beating Dublin, and, and they gave a good account of that there against Tipperary. But no, Dublin will will be will be pleased. It was it just it was it was a question for them in Crow Park getting the job done. They got the job done, and and they, they can't really ask for much more. And to Kenny though, will represent a big step up next week. Yeah, um, just the way he says there, you know, about um about the game and like for for the first sort of 15, 20 minutes, it kind of felt like Dublin were just kind of every time Dublin, you know were threatened a wee bit, we at least got back to a point. Dublin just kind of opened up a gap again, sort of two, three points every time, and then eventually kind of started the move away just before half-time. Um, obviously, Leach will go into to the qualifiers. Do you think there, they, there's any chance in? Do you think, like depending on obviously how the draw and stuff goes, but do you think there's a certain team that, that maybe they might be able to beat, or do you think that the, sort of, the, the, the rest of the, the teams will probably be happy enough to play Leach? I think, Jerry, to be honest, which I think the rest of the teams will be very happy to play a leash, but I don't think there's any re- repeat pairings allowed. And I would have said they would like to have got a crack at Dublin, but I know I don't think that that that, um, that they'll be probably that they'll be able to beat another team. Now, having said that, Eddie Brennan is doing very, very good work in leash. They, they, um, they last year they had a bit, bit of a big enough panel, but this year they think they don't really have the same strength and depth. And their target was to stay in Division One this year. They stayed in Division One. They overcame Carlo by a point in the penultimate group game, but there's no relegation from the name McCarthy this year, so anything's really a bonus. But I suppose if you look at the teams they could potentially play, well, they're going to Clare, like Clare missing a few, but I, I think Clare would still be too strong for Leach, and Waterford Cork would probably be too strong for Leach, and, and probably the same with Wexford Galway and Limerick and Tip. Like, but like I suppose if, if they had a more park hopping on a normal year like last year against Dublin, they went ahead of Dublin very early. And they caused a shock, but I don't think they're going to, they're going to have it behind closed doors. They, it's, it's, I, it's very hard to see it, Jerry, to be honest with you. So just whenever you say there about the the, McCar- the McCarthy, there's no relegation from it. So what what way is it working next year? Is it going to be six, six teams in each, or is it is it possibly going to be mixed up, or what way is it going? There's going to be ten teams in the Liam McCarthy, and there's going to be six teams in the Joe McDonough. So what the story is, there's ten teams in the Liam McCarthy. Actually, no, I'm, I'm actually slightly misinforming you there, Jerry. there's actually going to be a six-team Leinster Championship next year, so the winners of the Joe McDonough are going to go up to the, to the, to the Leinster Championship, there'll be six teams in that, and then there's no team going down. Then that would leave four teams in the Joe McDonough, but they're promoting the two Christy Ring finals this year, so there's going to be six teams in the Joe McDonough next year, and six teams in the Leinster Championship. Okay. Um, so, just, just, on, just on lease as well, just there's kind of, obviously, because, you know, the, the McCarthy Cup, do you think, do you think, like, um, do you think Leash are are obviously happy to be in the the McCarthy Cup? Because like the way I would kind of look at it is, obviously the Joe McDonoughs are kind of the second tier. But you know, to me, the only thing better than sort of winning the Joe McDonough Cup is is probably not being in it. You know, and, and being in the McCarthy the McCarthy Cup. Because like 
I think if you want to progress in hurling, you want to be playing at the highest level. But do you think there there are counties that that are quite quite content and maybe would rather play in a competition that's their level rather than you know be be defeated heavily like we've seen Leash? No, I think from talking to players, they'd rather be at a higher level in the hurling because sometimes the lower championships are nearly ignored. They have bad crowds and had, there wouldn't be much interest, maybe and maybe not much coverage. So I think the players would be be in the Lee McCarthy. But Leash are a county that like, they absolutely deserve to be in the Lee McCarthy camp. If you look at it, like they won the Joe McDonald last year and they won it very, very where They bet Dublin then and then like they got promoted. They bet Westmead in 2013 in the in the league. And they haven't been down since in Division 2. So they've been eight years nearly as a Division 1 hurling team as well. So no, Leash definitely deserve their place at the top table. And they're putting in good work at underage. Their players are coming through. So I think no, Leash definitely are, are Lee McCarthy side of merit. And I'd say every county would much rather be at the top. Because at the top, you're kind of, you can develop hurling. It's very, very hard to be developing hurling when you're playing so-called weaker teams but with no crowds and no interest in everything, Jerry. So I think no, definitely in hurling especially, you have to be at the top to develop as, as a county. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you say that. To be honest, you know, because it, it does like, like I know sort certainly in recent years, you know, it hasn't been as as much for Antrim, but like one of the things, you know, that like consistently, you know, you hear from people involved in Antrim hurling is that like they want to be playing at the top levels, and it kind of feels almost a wee bit like the doors been the doors been shut on them in some ways, you know, just because you have to, you know, you have to so so to say earn your place. In these um these counties in these uh these competitions um and like to me to me personally you know like I I'm not a fan of tiered formats like I understand why they're there you know because there is such a disparity in the, the level of hurling um across across the country but I just uh, you know I think that, that you know boys travel and and they're they're playing they're training all this time and you know they want to play at the highest level so um you know for me. If Leash, if Antrim, if Westmeath, Kerry, Meath, uh, Carlo, any of them teams, if they can push their way up, and you know, only makes it a better competition and a better level. So we'll move on to Sunday and the Munster um, quarter final between Clare and Limerick. And to sort of for me, um, I thought there was there was kind of a bit of similarity in the two games in that Clare, albeit they hung on sort of to half time. Um, before Limerick sort of stepped up the gears, but it was kind of similar that like the sort of the underdog, um, stuck with the stuck with the favourite for a while, and then uh, eventually you know that the class told. So what did you what did you make of the game yourself? I thought it was it was a good game. I heard it. I thought maybe the intensity mightn't have been as strong as other years, which came from the lack of fans in separate stadium. I think people seem surprised. Then they kind of expect the championship to hurl, and it's normally. God's game, they call it, and, and to do with the real nature, pack stadiums there, and it could have been a great game if that was a first round robin game in Gaelic grounds or an NSC to have a big Limerick crowd or NSC Cusack Park could be packed out it would if it was one of those games. But I think people kind of got shocked when they saw an empty Semper Stadium. It's a big stadium, and there was a real eerie silence on, on the on the TV really yesterday. Now I suppose the hurling itself, the quality was fantastic, but both teams really went for it. Like there was Limerick scored thirty six points, Clare scored one twenty three. Like it's rare you get sixty two points in the game. I heard and really like so. But look, it was it was a savage, savage game. Um, for in terms of skill level, Limerick pulled away towards the end. Clear stayed in the game at half time. Tony Kelly played inside. Kelly is a fantastic hurler. He's one of the best hurlers I've ever seen in my life. And and he he played inside. And it prompts the question. Limerick probably took a bit where we're kind of taken aback a small bit by that because they probably expected Kelly to be out around midfield. But Limerick just kind of they didn't. They kind of stuck to their own game and stuck to the process as they called it. And they kind of. They ended up scoring 36 points and they sucked Clare in towards the end and Clare had to go for it and Limerick took full advantage. But John Cowley would be very, very happy. Um, like Shane O'Donnell was kept very, very quiet yesterday for Clare. He he probably wanted to get to get in and get it. If, they, if Clare could have got him one-on-one inside, they could have had a few goals and they could have been right in the game. But I thought Clare actually didn't do too bad yesterday. I thought that they competed well for, for large parts. They um, they certainly weren't disgraced. They're 23 years now before since they've won a provincial title. It's going to be going to a thir- 23rd year they're not out of the championship yet, and they'll be very, very hard beaten in the qualifiers. But I think Limerick yesterday, they looked, they looked the parish, I Jerry, so they did. How many, how many points did um, did Kelly end up on? I remember, like, I remember, sorry, I think he had about sixteen. Was there still maybe five or ten minutes to go? How many did he end on? Seventeen points and nine of them yeah. free, so eight, eight points in play. Like that, that is serious going for for a player, and and 
they're probably a small bit too reliant on him. But then they get lads they're missing. If you look at John Condon and these fellas, Paul Collins and, and those lads like and Peter Duggan and, and Colin Galvin, Ian Galvin, like those lads could have scored a few points between them and then ten points suddenly could have been down to one or two legs. Like, so so clear not a million miles off the pace, but they haven't won a game in the under twenty or under twenty one championships since two thousand and fifteen. And before that they had won three of those championships in a row. So they're probably not as strong the players coming through as might be coming through in Limerick and Tipperary and Cork. So that's certainly an issue for Clare at the moment. But like as we mentioned the last day, a very, very good generation could pass them by and like that's another year without a Munster title. Okay, they they won not Ireland in the meantime, but but Limerick um, Limerick on the other hand are, are in a very, very good place. Um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned about the crowd. It's one one thing that I kind of felt watching the game. I think, you know, certainly in a Munster Championship game, um, it's kind of one of them things where, like, you know, you talk about your sports bucket list, like, you want to go and see this, you want to go and see that. Like, to, to me, it's like, you know, a, month, a Munster hurling final. It just, it just the atmosphere seems crazy. And, you know, watching the two games at the weekend, obviously, in the empty stadiums, and uh, I, I sort of wonder... Um, it did. It did feel a wee bit flat, and obviously, I think a lot of the time in hurling, um, maybe players feed off the atmosphere. Um, do you think that there there will be sort of like a a bit of a difference in this championship um, from the playing perspective because of the lack of fans, or do you think that maybe I'm getting that impression because the games weren't particularly close? No, I, I think that you're definitely on something there, Jerry. I think that the fans make the Munster Championship and they make the hurling in general. And it's actually funny, you mentioned earlier about the tier championships and the teams. And I say a lot of the reason teams don't want to be playing in the tier championship is you go playing in some venue and it wouldn't be a county's main ground. And you might have 10 people in 10 seagulls at the game, do you know? So like people wouldn't really have any interest in those tier championships. And the crowd, like when you go up and play in the top level, there's a big crowd, there's a big lot at stake. And if you can put them under pressure... The, the, the underdog's crowd really gets behind the team if it looks like there's a shock at all. So I think that's why players wouldn't like to be playing in those smaller competitions. Like, like to be honest with you, if there was even 200 fans allowed, that could sell out an awful lot of Nicky Rackard, Laurie Maher, and maybe even Christy Ring games to an extent. Like, so like, I, I just don't know if they... Is it, I think that's why people and players might not like playing in those maybe lower tier competitions because there is no atmosphere. And I think the atmosphere certainly makes hurling. If you look at Walsh Park in Waterford last year, it was absolutely wedged the first day that they cleared. It was a smashing atmosphere. But if you went down to another game in another county, there could be 50 fans on a good day. And it's just, it's not the same at all. So I think definitely we'll notice in the latter stages that, that without the fans, the teams will be, there'll be less pressure on the players, really. They'll be, they'll be more inclined to try stuff. And maybe that's why we're getting high scoring games that we have been at the weekend. Mm-hmm. Well, I suppose, you know, if it, uh, if it encourages, um, Creativity, I suppose, in one way it could be, it could be a good thing. But obviously, you know, as soon as as soon as all's well, you know, I think the the game will be better off for the full stadiums, and certainly the 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 fans certainly make a make a big part of the occasion. Yeah, so, empty stadiums aren't really aren't really. I think fans have to come in as soon as possible. Now, obviously, whenever it's safe, but but I think it, it's definitely an essential part of the game. Okay, so we'll move on then to the um, the Joe McDonough Cup. Um, the two games this week, um, Kerry versus Meath and Antrim versus Westmeath. So you commented on the Kerry and Meath game and you felt that Kerry, you know, if they were going to be making a push in this competition, this was a, a must-win game for them. And they did win the game. Um, they won the game quite comfortably, won 20 to 13 points. Um, so... Do you think Kerry can, can push on from that? Well, this was the first task for them. They had a very, very good league in some ways. They won four games, lost one, Antrim bet them in the final. Now, they're after losing two finals in a row, so they won't say they had a good game. But they competed well in, in every game. And, and I suppose this was probably similar day. If they win this game, it was kind of the first step on the board. They're playing Westmead next weekend. And if they hadn't beaten me, they probably would have been essentially out of the championship in a lot of ways now. But, but they managed to win the match. And like, I think that that's all they can really ask for. Shane Conway scored nine points, not all three, he's the best there, but Shane Nolan stepped up and scored one, two yesterday for Kerry. So they really um they really kind of push um put me to bed in the second half. And me 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 gave a good account of says they're not a bad team, but they're probably not maybe not just as strong as the other teams in the competition at the moment. But yeah, Kerry did ten point win and, and they'll they'll definitely take that and go into Mullingar next weekend. Okay, and um the other game then was probably 
certainly in the build up you would have probably expected um a tight game but probably a game you know maybe to go the other way um with Hunter being affected by covid and stuff i think there was sort of like four or five players out in the end but um, but in the end, Antrim seemed to, to just blow Westmead away, 425 to 115. Um, what sort of you know message do you think that sends out to the rest of the competition? It definitely sends out a message, Jerry, that, that Antrim, are, Antrim are, are the top dogs in the team to beat at the moment. And I just, I was watching the game yesterday and like Antrim were just completely dominant. There was like, a, there were seven points up, I think, at half time, having played against the Breeze. So they were really, the game was probably over as a contest at half time. And then, they made sure that after the break, but Antrim played some scintillating hurling throughout. Like they were just literally, it was like just, uh, it was just. I'd say if you were an Antrim fan, as you are, it was just one of those days for the first time maybe in a long while where you could really, really be optimistic as an Antrim perspective. Like last year, they bet Kerry by fourteen points in the first round. They didn't really push on as they should have done, and they hope that not the same thing doesn't happen this year. But I just think that Antrim, like they just looked, they looked apart all around the pitch, like them. Um, Kieran Clark came in, scored two eight, like two two from or two one from a from play. Connor McCann was was very very good. Joe Maskey was very very good. Like they just looked like they looked like a serious serious team. Jared Walsh had a great game as well. Like so, like Aidan O'Brien got a goal. He came in for Neil McManus, who was injured. So like you couldn't actually pick out a negative aspect of the Antrim of the Antrim performance. And they really really um, looked like they looked like champions yesterday, Terry, To be honest with you. And where do you think it leaves with me? Do you think it'll just be a case of, you know, that was, you know, as good as it, as good as it gets for Antrim. Turned up, beat, beat them on a good day. And now to be looking, you know, thinking probably there's a, there's a competition there between a couple of other teams and just to try and force their way into the final. Well, Westmead have to be Kerry next weekend or they're going to be in serious trouble. They'll probably be out with the competition. I think there's no relegation this year and they're going to kind of change the format. But like... Westmead really have to beat Kerry and, and to be honest with you Westmead are going to have to win their next three games now is that an insurmountable task it's probably not they're playing Carlo Kerry at home and then um, Mead away but they're going to have to win those three games and then come back to the final where Antrim are going to have a lot more lads back so the odds probably I suppose Westmead they can only really focus on the Kerry match and they think they have a good chance of beating Kerry at the weekend but no it wasn't a good day yesterday from a Westmead perspective but I don't like to be too critical of the team but I think because often you can take away from a brilliant performance by being, I won't say negative, but by saying that the other team was just terrible. And I don't think that would be fair in Antrim because Antrim were absolutely fantastic and they didn't let Westmead hurl yesterday. And I think Antrim, like, it nearly reminds me, Jerry, of when uh, Jim McGuinness took over Donegal and they were at a bad, well, Donegal, Donegal were at a bad enough patch and they just weren't fulfilling their potential. Now, to be fair, Antrim have definitely improved in the last few years. But this year, like, when in Donegal's first year at McGuinness, they... They won a league title and it was they were in Division Two. They got up to Division One, and this year Darren Gleeson has come in with Antrim. They won Division Two, got up to Division One, and they played absolutely fantastic hurling in the first match. Now, I'm not saying Antrim are going to go on and win all Ireland or anything, but like Antrim has the potential to be a serious, serious hurling county. Like the club game in Antrim is very, very strong. Like a lot of counties would only be would only crave a club championship like that, so they would. And like Antrim, the city in Belfast, there's a big interest in the city as well, and if they can get everything united, everything camp, there's absolutely huge potential there, and they're definitely good enough to be a Liam McCarthy team and. They'd absolutely love nothing more than to win that competition this year to Joe McDonough and, and prove themselves as a worthy Liam McCarthy team. I think it's important what you say about the teams in Belfast. I know we've talked we've talked about it offline and um to me, whenever I sort of seen obviously um St John's and, and Rossa performed well in the county championship this year, um, which you know was nice to see. Um usually it's just kind of a toss up between, you know, which two of Dunloy, Lock Gill and Christian Dahl meeting the meeting the final. So it was good to see um, obviously it did end up done now in that game, but you know the, the Belfast teams made a bit of an impact and made the made the the country teams work for it. And um, so I think it's interesting to see. You know, I, it says to you that I hope that you know it's not a case of the the country teams are maybe falling back, and instead it is a case of the Belfast teams going forward. And certainly from the county perspective, it looks you know there's been a lot of positives um, around the last two weeks. You know, a big win against uh, Westmeath, and obviously getting a place in, in uh, Division 1. So, you know, it does look positive at the minute for Antrim, but, you know, moving on to the next week, you know, you know that it's always, um, there, there's always a fear of one step forward and two steps back. So, do you think, um, just just the, the team that we're missing out this weekend that didn't play in the Joe McDonough, do you think Carlo, um, we're looking at any of the games and thinking, you know, that, that there's a, a place for them possibly in the in the final, or do you think that they're, they're maybe 
a wee bit below below the standard of the, the others. No, I think they definitely are, uh, they could easily be placed in the final for them. And I think that this next weekend against Carlo is a massive game for them because if they win that game against or against Antrim even in Carlo, but if they win that game, they're in a great, great position at Carlo. Like if they win that game now, they have a great chance to get into a final. Like Antrim will really fancy their chances now. They have Kerry at home, so that's it. And that awful long journey down to Kerry, and they'd fancy their chances of beating me the way. Like so, if they can beat me the way and maybe win one other match, they're definitely in the final. Like so, like that's that that's um. They, they have something to really to aim for now, Antrim, and they've kind of got the COVID scare out of the way, hopefully early now, and uh, I, I just think that Antrim, that they're definitely, definitely, definitely the team to watch. I was hearing word they were going fierce well. Westmead was their first game back. It, it was, Westmead have had a brilliant record against Antrim since 2014. It's only Antrim have beaten them in the League or Championship in, in six years before yesterday, and Antrim really, really ended that hoodoo um, yesterday, and they ended it in style. Like, Westmead knocked them out of the League last year and knocked them out of the Championship, so... Westmead had the upper hand over Antrim, but this year Antrim have certainly um they certainly ended that hoodoo yesterday. Now, if both sides do meet in a joint on a final, Antrim will definitely, definitely have an upper hand after yesterday. But Westmead need to focus purely, purely on getting over Kerry next weekend and, and Kerry will come to Mullingar. I say it'll probably be slight favour to the bookmaker and that game really, really is a crucial game next Saturday. Okay, and um, just with it, maybe sort of staying with the hoodoos and stuff as well, you know, obviously Westmead have beat Antrim a few times in the league, and and uh, I think both Carlo and Meath, possibly Christy Ring Finals, which sort of over the last five or six yeah. years have beat Antrim. So, um, you know, I think there's a few a few scores to be settled, which obviously from a biased perspective, I hope they do, you know, because, it, you know, it would mean a lot to the county to be up in the, the Liam McCarthy, but there's still a lot of hurling to be played, and... Uh, Matches yeah. to be won, so there's still a lot of work to do, and hopefully, um, hopefully we'll get plenty of entertaining hurling over the next few weeks in, in it. So just before we go, we'll we'll move down just and sort of talk about the the results anyway in the other the other competitions. So I think in the Chris Ring Cup, I think there was actually only one match that was played, and it saw Wicklow beat Ross Common. Yeah, um, did that you was catch one. any of that game? Or? It was just I was just following it briefly on Twitter, Jerry, but I just going back on that with Andrew. I think Neil Peden is doing serious work there as I think he's a director of Hurling so Antrim really really have structures in place as well and the last two years like last year they certainly made big improvements this year they kind of pushed on in 2018 and 17 they kind of they, they, they've improved nearly gradually every year so it's kind of coming fully to to, to pay for them at the moment it's, it's kind of fully fully paying off at the moment but just going back on that then Wicklow Ross Common yeah Wicklow got the win they have a very very good record against Ross Common in recent years the other three games fell by by the wayside I think Offaly couldn't feel due to Covid against them against Kildare, they had to concede, and Derry, Derry got a win over Sligo by default, as well as Sligo couldn't feel, and then obviously London aren't in the competition, so Down got a win there, so there was actually four games, and they've had three winners this weekend, with only one team actually having, or four winners, and only one team have had to actually earn the win, so so um, Wicklow got the win yesterday, that put them in a good enough place, it was the first round, first win, Wicklow are kind of coming and hurling as well, they have a bit of a bit of a garden garden academy, I think, or something like that going, going on in Wicklow at the moment, and it's kind of again they're a big big urban county kind of coming off them um, off the Dublin suburbs and if you can get those towns kind of around Bray and, and those places in Wicklow, Carnew where another another very, very hurling hurl stronghold in Wicklow. And if you can get those um those areas kind of kind of delivering players then then you then then Wicklow will, will will continue to improve. But they got relegated. I think they they're kind of in I think they're in, in division division two A at the moment. And two A is the third tier. And if you're in two A then you have a realistic target of getting to Division One if you can continue to improve. Like so, so Wicklow are, are coming as a county, and Roscommon, Roscommon are, are a proud hurling county as well. They have a few few clubs there, four roads and, and at league and four pierces, and those clubs kind of put in put in good work too. Like so, Wicklow got the win yesterday. Roscommon and Wicklow could could both be potentially contenders for that competition. Although, although it's very very hard to look past off if they if they can get back from from their from their setback at the weekend with COVID. Obviously, the the competition itself. Um, we were talking about the format of it, so we reckon then what's happening is the the four winners um play and the four losers will also play, and then the the winners of that play again and play against the defeated semi finalists. Is that right? And then two, it's like it's very confusing, isn't it? Yeah, well, there's not a lot of information published on it actually, uh, Jerry. To be honest, but Kildare and Wicklow is the draw for next weekend, and Down and Derry. And I suppose if you didn't know any foreign guys between the counties, you'd be thinking those games are local derby, so they are. Especially Down and Derry is a repeat of the of the recent Division Two B final, which Down won. But whoever wins that game, then will I think they're into a semi final, and then 
the losers of those games have a second chance too. Like so, I think the losers of of down Derry Kildare Wicklow will go and play the other losers. Well, awfully have to play a losing team as well. One of the, I, I don't know how that job it made, but no, it's all very very up in the air at the moment with regarding format. But awfully are awfully are definitely the team to beat in that competition. And okay, they did lose the game, but they have to give give Kildare a walkover. But if they can if they can come back and um, if they can come back awfully now, they'll have a serious kick in, and every game is do or die for them now, and it would be an absolute disaster for them. Okay, COVID is one thing. If they have to forfeit due to COVID, nobody can say it's a disaster really in terms of on the pitch. But if they actually lose a match with a full team this year, it'll be a real disaster for Offaly if they don't come up at one, on the first time of asking. And they could come up if they lose the final, but that's not the way you want to come up for a hurling county like Offaly. Like you want to be coming up as winners of the competition, like really. Yeah. Okay, and um, just touch on the Nicky Record Cup then. So, um. Tyrone obviously got through against, they were supposed to play Warwickshire, so they got through. Um, Donny Gall beat Longford and Mayo beat Monaghan. Did, did Armagh and Leitrim play? I think Armagh did Armagh. Armagh, Armagh, won that game. Armagh won that game, did it, Jay? Armagh, Armagh won that game. Um, so I think that's actually the, the results that you, you predicted last week. You thought that Mayo, Armagh and Donny Gall um, would go through and obviously Tyrone's gone through as well as, as Warwickshire aren't able to, to come, up, come over and play. Um, so no surprises there. Um, yeah. So Donegal, yeah, Armagh, and Tyrone and Mayo is the next round as well. Donegal plays Armagh and Tyrone versus Mayo are the are the Nicky record in, in the next round of the competition. I think Armagh and Donegal, if I'm not mistaken, I think they were the top two in three A as well. So you know that looks like it in paper it could be a good game. Um, certainly you know two evenly matched teams. So it'll be interesting to see how that one goes. Yeah. Just um just then just before we wrap up the, the hurling, um the Lorry Meher Cup or Lorry Meher, whatever it is. Um Fermanagh beat Louth um in the one game. Obviously, I think there's only three teams in this competition. So Fermanagh, Louth and Cabin. So Fermanagh got off the win and start and obviously next weekend they're, they're in action again against Cavan. Um so yes, um that's all for the hurling. So um my thanks to, to Connor for joining us. Um, lots of lots of interesting uh, points uh, made as always. Um, so we will be back later in the week um, with another hurling um, preview of next week's action. Um, we'll be back later on today as well with um, with some football um, coverage, um, wrapping up the the national the national football league, the final weekend, the matches. So um, my thanks to you, the listener, and uh, again, thanks to Connor. So um, thanks very much for joining us.